All right. Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farron, coming with the company Horns of Odin. And not, as always, um, I'm joined by Joshua Root. Um, people have seen him many times on the show. I think this is your third or fourth appearance. Um, yeah, you're sitting in for Mateus. Unfortunately, Mateus has some family issues to deal with. Um, he's taking a week off, but you're there. I feel like you're the right man for the job for this topic. I am Matthias, or rather, <laughs> Matthias as he should be. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, Josh, do you want to give a quick rundown of who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'm, I'm a researcher of Old Norse religion, uh, doing my PhD at the University of Iceland. Uh, I'm also in too many music projects, uh, black metal band Nexion. Uh, I'm uh, collaborating on uh, Jonas Lorenzen's uh, Nabala, uh, and I have my own super top secret project that I've been hinting at forever that's still not being unveiled. Other than oh, I'm, is that not out there yet? I will, not out say, yet. I will say Lorenz, uh, Jonas, and uh, Shell, and some other uh, fantastic uh, artists are. Uh, are on are also helping with that project so it's getting there so then oh, I'm, well. I'm working on uh, giving lectures uh, if uh, if people have been following me on my social media uh, and that's what i've been up to researching making music and uh giving lectures that's who i am what more do you need oh, i need more i have to find <laughs> some more things so i can get totally overwhelmed <laughs> yeah definitely it's uh yeah, you can always do, you can always find more, more room for, for the, the gym. You can go to the gym a bit more. I go to the gym five days a week, sometimes. Exactly, six. that's what I mean. Oh man, before we, <laughs> I'm just to say a little story, but before we started, I was actually, I was late because I dropped a fucking 25 kilo plate on my big toe Ooh. right right before, um, like an hour before. Do you lift been... barefoot? Do you lift uh, in shoes or uh, do you take your shoes off? <laughs> No, I was trying to put on the leg press and I got a little distracted and just missed, completely missed the, uh, oh, the oh. little, little slot for it. And yeah, it uh, just landed, yeah, landed clean on my toes. So that's why I was I was late to this. I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, I've so, been done for. I lift barefoot. So if I drop oh, it on my foot, I'd be done. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's one of those things. I'm always one of those people that say, Edge, yeah, move your foot. Just move your foot. Yeah. So if you drop something, just move your foot. Yeah, like, just move your foot just, quick. Just move your foot quick. And it's not always that easy. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you sometimes you yeah, you just don't have time to do it. Um no. so so how are you how how are you? How's life? Obviously, um, if you haven't heard Josh's episodes before, please go back and listen to him. I think we've done one on Yule, one on um cultural appropriation and I'm sure there was. I'm sure it there was another one in cultural there. appropriation. It was about uh, locked hair traditions. Oh, it was, <laughs> which is not cultural appropriation. <laughs> that was. That's it. That's that's the one. <laughs> yeah. But one, one other. I don't, I'm sure there was one more in there. I'm sure there, there was. I don't remember it though. It might have just been me talking about. I think me. it might have been about um, metal music and Viking culture. I think. Ah, something. Something. Maybe it was early on. You don't want to listen back to those early ones. Mm, well. I mean, you can. <laughs> <laughs> They're not very good. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what's going on? What's going on with you? You, I know you. You're looking at. Did you set up a new business? You looking at setting a name up? Yeah. Is yeah. that ready to shout out? I might as well drop drop. Uh, I'm pretty. I don't know how to keep secrets, so I, I just. Kind well, of, if you don't want to, Shank can always cut it out after. Ah, it doesn't matter. I'm uh, I'm 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 starting up. Uh, I've already started it. T technically, I have a, a business. I just haven't gone through all the at its uh, knowledge platform. Uh, just basically doing what I'm doing, but with a little bit more structure to it. Uh, and I've uh, I asked on social media, what should I name it, and got a million different responses. But I liked yours the most, and you you kind of helped me decide. You know what? People are going to. There's never going to be the perfect one. You have to make one come to life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that, yeah, that I think that's somebody told me that. And I can't remember who it was. Yeah. Um, no, but it's when true. I was, 
it, it's true well, with music bands too. I mean, you know, when you name a you name your metal band, you can argue all day over what should I what should we name our band. Yeah. But, it doesn't really matter what you name it, honestly. <laughs> it's not important until you become something and then you you become the name and the name becomes something. Exactly. I mean, as long as you don't name your band Jizz Cakes or something. It will... <laughs> I'm sure somebody has out there. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, definitely. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> Semen Toast Crunch. Oh. Um... <laughs> Uh, Kelly's throwing you back to the last episode with the runk wax. So yeah. we could uh, could be that. Um, no, no but I named it uh, Eagle on the Ash, and uh, and that's what it'll be going with. And I'll give announcements; it'll grow. So, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's what I'm working on. Perfect. Just gonna educate some people. Yeah, and have fun too, because I'm. I mean, I'm also going to. I think I'm going to use it for teaching about ritual and ceremony and and doing music through it and so it's going to be a pretty cool platform not just classes if it develops <laughs> develop into a brand that's what you yeah want. that's what you want yeah then i can perfect <laughs> should we should we get into the northman we the, yes the let's movie. dive into the northman oh no actually before that let me let me do a little bit of housekeeping um I was meant to do at the start of the show, but forgot. So, I mean, I, I think probably to to most people who just listen to the show and the not on the on the Discord or in the Patreon to watch live shows, it probably seems like everything's just been relatively smooth lately. Um, but we've been we've been kind of up and down with recording times and moving stuff about, and a little bit all over lately. And hopefully, from now on, we're going to get back to our usual schedule. But I just want to kind of say thank you to to all the patrons and all the people who've kind of stuck with us whilst we've been up and down. Obviously, the patrons get an extra bonus episode every week. If you want to get those, just pop over to Patreon forward slash Naughty Mythology Podcast. But yeah, we've been a, a little all over the place. We've had some stuff going on, but now we're, you know, we're going to get back. We're going to really kind of hit the road and, and, and take, this, take this thing as far as we can. But I just wanted to give a shout out to people like you, Josh, and obviously like Jonas Lorenzen that we, that we lean on when, when we need when we, uh, you know, when things go wrong, we, we call you guys up and we're like, fuck, come and, come and help us out. <laughs> I, I, we, uh, we appreciate it, or at least I appreciate it. Uh, it was, uh, it's, it's fun. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. So, yeah, no, I just wanted to get out of the way because, you know, we, we do appreciate everyone that's stuck by us whilst we've missed episodes, moved episodes, cancelled things. You know, it's, it can get frustrating. It gets frustrating for, for me. So I can only assume what it's like for other people that kind of expect, these things to go out at a certain time so yeah we we appreciate you um if you do like the show obviously patreon best way to support us um yeah you get an extra episode every week either me uh, me and Mateus doing a, a q a where you get to ask Mateus anything or you get a story time episode where Jonas Lorenzen does a fantastic job of narrating one of the Icelandic sagas and that's uh, a lot of fun but yeah we're here to talk about the Northman obviously it's the new Robert Eggers film uh, every it seems to be fucking everywhere at the minute yeah yeah uh more well, maybe well maybe it's everywhere in our circles <laughs> i don't think it is though i think it's i think they they put some marketing into it i saw mm. I, i've seen buses driving past with it on um, mm -hmm. i've i've seen a few um like unrelated instagram pages talking about it and and even being invited to the premiere and that kind of thing so i think that I think they've definitely put the work into the, the marketing side on this. Yeah, uh, I, I've been surprised. Uh, the more I, I talk about it uh, and post on social media and talk to my my circle, what really shocks me is 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 not just how much work they put into the marketing, because that's not my interest. What's my interest in is how many researchers how many how how far out robert eagers reached to to mm. get the right names and the right people involved in the production it, more mm. and more people that i know who are the right people for the job keep coming out of the woodworks and saying oh yeah i i did this for the film or i did that for the film yeah it, it's impressive really it impressive. is it is impressive um so before we start let's just say you know there are gonna be spoilers in here if you haven't seen the movie then, I mean, it's not a spoilery film. We, we said that before. You know, it's not something where there's a huge twist and we're going to we're gonna ruin it. 
Um, but if you don't want to kind of know any nuances about the, the history, then, then, you know, tune out and then come back when you've, when you've watched it. Um, Cause we were going to try and do it without spoilers, but I think we're just going to fuck it up. You know, we're going to, we, we've got to talk about it to really get into it. I mean, also if, I mean, have you not seen Hamlet or, or <laughs> that, I, I hear that. I, that's what I see all the time is everybody saying that, it's based on Hamlet, but wasn't, am I right in thinking that Hamlet was based on a, an Icelandic saga or have I made that up? You, you were half right. Half? <laughs> Story <laughs> of my life. Stop Story crediting my life. the, the Icelanders don't deserve credit for everything. Uh, okay. you know, uh, uh, <laughs> um, Hamlet is Shakespeare's um, uh, uh, rendition or his version of a, an old legend that is not Icelandic, although it does have an Icelandic version. Uh, but it, it comes, it goes back to uh, essentially uh, Saxo Grammaticus, a Dane, a Danish. Okay. So it actually goes back even further than him um, to the the Chronicle of Lera. But but Saxo Grammaticus is the one who really tells a, a legend about this king and. Uh, omelet, as he calls him, which of course Shakespeare calls omelet or not omelet, <laughs> uh, Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but his version is quite different than Robert Eager's version, mm -hmm. so but but yeah, it, it is based on an existing legend. So, why, why do you think everybody just pinpoints Hamlet then? Um, as this because that, that's the criticism. That I've seen of the film so far is people are like, oh, it's just it's just Hamlet. Um, why do you think that is? Why why do you think that they don't go? Okay, well, Hamlet was based on these older stories that predate it. Or do you think it's just because Hamlet is what it is and it's so popular? Right. I, I think it's just um, uh, people like to poo poo things. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, you're not wrong about and that. They like to, yeah, and, and, and they, but it's a very shallow, stupid criticism uh, because, um, <laughs> well, now I have to admit, I have not seen Hamlet. But uh, <laughs> I haven't seen Hamlet. Nah, nah, I'm too cool for that. To... <laughs> why, why would I have seen Hamlet? No, but, no, but, 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 but I have, I have read. Uh, up on what the what the plot of Hamlet is and, and stuff and and the, the fact of the matter is it's only loosely it's a loose it's like another version of the legend and I think that that's what people are missing when they talk about how oh it's only a retelling of you know Hamlet uh, first of all it's not a retelling of Hamlet it's a retelling of a very old legend that Hamlet is also a retelling of. There's also an Icelandic retelling of it. There's also Hrosaga uh, Krauka. Uh, there's a few sagas that are not about a character named Hamlet or Amleth that are uh, basically retellings of the same legend. So the point mm -hmm. is, uh, Robert Eagers is just the newest form of an ancient legend that reworks itself and retells itself and that's what legends are supposed to do and that's why mm -hmm. people miss the point it's not a retelling it, it, well it's not a it's not just hamlet it's not the story yeah exactly and, and i think i, I mean because i know saxo's version saxo's mm -hmm. original story and, and and i went to the northman saying i mean they gotta spruce this up because i find saxo's version to be boring mm -hmm. uh and they, oh, they did. It's uh, this, oh, version, yeah. this version is only loosely, very, very loosely based on it. And it's only half the story too, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got to admit that when I saw, when I saw that Robert Eggers was, was doing like a, a Viking movie or yeah. like a movie in this sphere, I got excited because mm -hmm. I, I love his movies just purely for the cinematography, the visuals. I think he yeah. makes incredibly beautiful movies um whatever you think of the story whether you like them or not i think visually they are insane and he really is a visionary in that in that area so that excited me regardless i knew that it was going to be a pretty movie um, and that certainly doesn't disappoint no no and i agree i i 
I mean, I don't know how many films Robert Eagers has. I know the the most popular are, of course, The Witch and The Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love The Witch. I didn't like The Lighthouse. I could see... The Lighthouse, again, is I think I'm probably the same with you. Mm. Um, But I think, again, it's still a pretty movie. Whether you like it or not, it's a pretty movie. Yeah, like you can see, it's one of those things where, yeah, it didn't catch me because it's not my thing. But you can look at it and you can see there is artistic vision in mm-hmm. what is being created here. It just doesn't hit me. The Witch, I absolutely loved. Yes. Um, I hated the ending, <laughs> but I still love the movie because mm-hmm. of what you said. Like, uh, it's not really the story. It's, it's, the, it's like he's painting this beautiful, dark work of art. And that's, yes. you know, there are scenes that are so perfect and so awesome that you like to watch it because of scenes and the whole atmosphere. Um, you can tell that I think you can tell that there's depth to things that yeah. there's re- even you know I don't think you even have to particularly know the world and, and appreciate I think you know even as an outsider of, of this kind of thing you can go and watch this movie and you just you can get a sense of there's depth to it that he's done his research that there really is more to it than just like a superficial kind of picture um, and that 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 stands out people can tell these things I think so I hope so uh, that was one of the things I was actually really wondering. I, I really kind of almost wish I could go around and, and see what people who are just kind of casual fans of Viking things, you know, not deep divers, uh, just just a casual fan, what they what they got out of it. Because, mm-hmm. because the depth in uh, The Northman and, and The Witch, but uh, The Northman being my, my the, the most newest one, it's really deep in and i don't mean that in that pretentious like oh you just don't understand it it's a super deep super deep reading into everything but mm-hmm. i i was i was very impressed with with so the, the subtleties in it that i don't think the casual viewer will get there are things that i didn't get my first or second time seeing it um and it's yeah it's like it, it i wonder how much of it gets picked up mm-hmm. Because so many people are talking about uh, uh, shirtless, ripped guys fighting and the, the so much violence, so much violence. The violence I think it's, was uh, secondary. Yeah. I th- I, I, what, what I find interesting and, and what I'm going to hopefully get, again, in the feedback from people who aren't in this, in this world is that it's so different to what you usually expect from like a Viking movie. If you, you know, if you don't know this this thing then mm. you kind of have this idea of what quote unquote the vikings are and what it should look like and and maybe even you've kind of seen the vikings the tv show and that kind of thing but this is this is different and yeah. this is this is a, like unapologetically itself it does its own thing and i and I'll, i want to find it would be interesting to see what people think of that and if it maybe changes their perceptions on what they think of all this mm-hmm. yeah i i think the the point that it's unapologetically itself it needs to be underscored uh i've been trying to kind of say that i've made a couple youtube videos talking about this uh because uh so many people are are talking about historical accuracy how accurate is it and we can go into that of course but but my 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 first point is that it historical accuracy is such a uh, that is a that's not the right question to ask for a movie like this because it's like asking if batman or 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 the the gotham the gotham uh gotham city is historically accurate well the cars work accurately the buildings are but it's got a very dark aura because it's a work of art in a fictional setting and it's the same with this it's it's a legend so everything is over the top everything is big it's dark because robert eagers writes dark stuff and it should be and it's unapologetically a work of his mind, but it's dragging out very deep roots. It's really going to the sources. And I think it made something that was quite authentic. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah. So the only question is, will people see it and think, ah, ah the Viking religion, it's, it, it is super dark, like, Ah, it's very dark, very violent, very evil, you know. Uh, of course, that's going to happen, but uh, whatever. I think, I've said this quite a few times on the podcast, that we, 
one of the things I think that draws people to to like this mythology is that we don't know everything, and there's so much that's open to your own personal interpretation, and it allows you to, to to put it into your own life and adapt it to yourself, and that's that's amazing. But then when you you get TV shows and movies, people then also go, okay, well that's not how I saw it, and yeah. then they get really upset and per- and personal about it. It's like, well, that's not how I envisaged envisage this so it must be wrong rather than just going okay well i have my way of this but this is just robert eggers version like you said it's this it's it's a fictional world and he's taken bits and tried to do what he can with it but it is a fictional world and it's a and it's fiction story um yeah. people kind of get too hung up on the the nuances of it being a hundred percent perfect here there and everywhere Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, my criticisms of it, my criticisms of it are actually have nothing to do with uh, any sort of accuracy, just more about cheesiness <laughs> in certain parts. It's, yeah, I I agree. Yeah. So um I was say before we before we jump into the to the exact kind of details of the historical accuracy of different different sections of the movie. Um I do want I, I do want to say that the one thing I want to give Robert Eggers absolute credit for is that he he was brave enough to to make the movie he wanted to make mm. and that he he didn't feel the need to have to over explain everything and spoon feed the audience yeah. it was it, it's a case of that he's he's put this together he's used he's put little easter eggs in there for people like me you um, mm. and everybody who's in this kind of world but then from an outsider hopefully there's enough there that might drag you in and make you want to research but it wasn't a case of like you see so many things where it's like you have to just feed everything all the time he's 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 believed in the audience and gone okay here's what i want to make fucking have this yeah. and either like it or don't but this yeah. is this is it and, yeah. I, and i really have to respect him for that i think what he did and what i what i i think this is the the mark of the uh, i mean this is this is what i i'm a big sci-fi fan uh and 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 i mean a real work of art, I think, when it comes to sci-fi or even fantasy is, can you create a world where the rules, the reality that these, these characters are acting in are not ours? So, for example, so much of Hollywood is basically people acting the way they do in all Hollywood movies, uh, but with a backdrop and aesthetics of whatever the setting is. And in this case... Uh, also in The Witch uh, and in The Lighthouse, I think this is what Robert Eagers does, is he creates a worldview for people. He, he creates the rules within a sort of reality that people operate within. And then that's the story, how characters act within this way of thinking. And so in The Witch, I mean, the scariest thing in The Witch is, is not The Witch. It's, it, to me, it was the the terrifying puritanic puritanicalism puritanism the, the terrifying uh, religiousness of the family and their mm-hmm. worldview was terrifying and in in uh, in uh, the northman he has he really has created a worldview working with researchers and and stuff to sort of create this sort of quote viking or or heathen worldview this particular worldview within within which the different characters operate that's tough to do and that takes mm-hmm. a lot of work and that's why there's so many layers to it mm-hmm. um and that, that that's brilliant and it's brave i think as a as a filmmaker um so because you you run the risk of becoming art art film that only a handful of people watch yeah <laughs> yeah you do um and yeah, I think I, th- I think it is a, a brave movie in, in that sense. Um, and I'm happy for that. I, I, yeah. I like things that are different. I'm sick of seeing like things that are just kind of plain and easy to understand. And it's, mm. it's boring. I want something that makes me think and makes me react and, and feel things. That's yeah. that's the that's the fun for me. So, mm. yeah, let's get into some some details, some right. actual kind of things that go on I, I want to start with my one probably I, one of my favorite scenes and that's the the, the drauger scene um where he goes into the burial mound to to find this legendary yeah. this legendary sword um what did what did you think uh that was also in my top three favorite scenes 
Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was cinematically beautiful. Um, and, but I don't, I don't know. What, what do you, okay, let me see. What, what, what's my, I really like how, first of all, it's not a, uh, you do have accounts of this in the sagas, of course. So uh, historically accurate, nobody's fighting. <laughs> Nobody's fighting uh, Draugar in the uh, sagas, of course not. But uh, you know, two really cool versions that are similar to it are uh, Grettir saga, where the Icelandic hero Grettir goes into a mound and uh, fights uh, uh, basically a haugbui, one who dwells within the mound, and basically the dead guy buried there, steals his treasure, takes a sword. Uh, and another version is uh, actually about a girl. Um, Hervir, uh, who uh, takes her, claims her father's sword. She goes into his burial mound where him and like 11 berserkers are buried. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a super cool, it's, uh, it's, it's contained in the, the saga of Hervir and Heydrich. But mm -hmm. uh, I think Caroline Larrington preserved the, the poetic aspects of that in, she put it in her poetic edda version. So it's, uh, you can read it. But uh, it's, she doesn't fight them. She just sort of has an argument with them and they give her the legendary sword of her father named uh, Tyrfing, so the Fang of Tyr. Yeah. Super fucking cool. So back Absolutely. to the movie. Yeah, so back to the movie. Well, I, oh, it was fucking awesome. The, the first of all, there's the, the realism of the, the, the ship burial uh, yeah. and just the things there were, were quite believable. Aside from the fact that it was in Iceland, <laughs> <laughs> because no they, they had ship burials in iceland but the 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 dead guy was like uh clearly like a, a, a very powerful chieftain with a, you know his helmet was like uh he's a like, big boy you know, it was like a vendel helmet yeah and a very ancient sword that i mean it was a bit older than the settlement of iceland but okay whatever the battle was fucking cool and i loved how at the end, he kind of beats it, and then the. Oh, I know. I oh, I thought you. I, I thought I knew what you were gonna say. Go on, carry on. I, oh no, no! I just love how he beats the. Oh yeah, okay. I also love how he shoves its head up its ass. <laughs> that's exactly what I was. I love that part. Yeah. That's what I was going for. Yeah. So he 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 beats the uh, dead guy, sodomizes him with his own head, and then the screen shifts, and you realize he's kind of having this battle with it in the spirit world or in the mental world is he even having it that's what's so fucking great about it he he kind of like rides the line between belief and objective reality throughout the movie except for a couple scenes um and ah, it was fucking beautiful it was top three scenes so that, mm -hmm. that's my review of that scene <laughs> no it was it was it was a lot of fun um and like you say it's it's not it's a tough one because if he'd have picked like you like you said the story about the the, the lady that goes in and there's the 12 berserkers and he'd done it exactly like that yeah. then people would people would say oh well he's just he's just copied that he's just yeah. done it like that but then he does it differently and then you get people say oh that's not accurate you didn't that didn't it's like what the fuck do you want yeah and I hate the I hate the accuracy thing because because it it's not as I've said to people uh, I mean the, the sagas are not historically accurate at all I mean they are I mean this is a story this is a legend told in modern form I mean we go and we see it in the theater but it's still a modern legend now it's probably going to become a part of our cultural you know we're gonna have memes and quotes and you know Thirteenth Warrior <laughs> has had a huge impact on our culture in terms of jokes that we make and stuff like that these are modern legends and it, it can't be a perfect rendition of an older legend that's stupid legends have to be alive they have to they have to develop and be their own mm -hmm. but if they can draw on authenticity that's where it's that's where it's powerful and that's what he does this this scene fits in with other scenes in the sagas of people fighting or dealing with dead people in mounds and negotiating or fighting to take stuff this fits that it just does it and it's in a new form it needs to mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely um all right the next 
the, I know we, we briefly spoke about the berserker scene before, yeah. um, which which interests interests me. Um, what what do you think about the berserker scene? Yes. So we 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 talked about when they when they raid the village, um, yeah. yeah, and Alexander Skarsgård looks like a fucking god amongst men. Whatever whatever that boy's eating, I fucking want it. He probably wasn't eating much for uh, the weeks leading up to the film. <laughs> no, and I'm sure he was on some quote <laughs> suppl- supplements. I'm pretty sure he was deep in a cut until a few minutes before the scene, and then I'm like, here, drink some sugar water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, he looks good without his shirt on, though, so fucking fair play to him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, the, well... Another one of my top three. So now we're going to hit two of my top favorite <laughs> scenes. I've actually a lot of favorite scenes, but the the scene where they're doing the chant, uh, where the berserkers are around the fire, where the Ulfhedna are the wolf warriors or berserkers. I don't know uh, if they ever refer to themselves as berserkers or Ulfhedna. I know he calls himself bear wolf, so he's both. <laughs> But uh, they're wearing wolf skins. So that ceremony, I fell in love with. Uh, because mm-hmm. because um, as a researcher, when or, or, or just any fan, when, when you're looking at, for example, the picture stones, the Gotland picture stones, or, the, or you get these, these, uh, these uh, artifacts that depict scenes, and you know these scenes were made by actual, you know, heathen people from that period of time. But that's all you have is this scene. It's just a glimpse into this worldview. And you can't get more than that. And you, you imagine what could it depict? What sort of s- ceremonies could be behind this scene that are gone forever? And you want to see it done. And you want to see it done in cool ways. And that's what this did. Uh, if you, most people that listen probably already know about it, but if you type in uh, or you look up the Tors Lund uh, panel or just the Tors Lund helmet plate, uh, it's a very famous image of a horned fi- a figure wearing a horned headpiece with two spears doing a kind of dance. Mm-hmm. And next to them, uh, this figure is a, another figure in a wolf or a bear skin. Mm. I think it's like the typical thing that when someone Googles Berserker, that's kind of the image yeah. you're going to see. Everyone, everyone will have seen that for sure. Exactly. Uh, and, and we only can imagine what, what sort of... We, we, we assume that these do depict rituals. There's a lot of scenes of figures wearing horned headgear. And I actually wrote, uh, I wrote uh, in my thesis, I wrote about ideas about what this meant. And one of the ideas is that this is the cult of warriors perhaps dedicated to Odin, or at least some of them dedicated to Odin, this, this band of killers that try to convince themselves that they are killers mm-hmm. and that they are tougher, that they are brave enough and tough enough and unbeatable enough to run into a battle. Uh, berserkers, people that live in a life of constant war, and you imagine these ceremonies. And that was so cool because the, he created this vi- image where the guy leading it is wearing the headpiece and he's chanting it. And the other guys are kind of his wolf pack. Mm-hmm. And I, I, it was, it was the first depiction I've ever seen of that plate, you know, put into a live action scene. Yeah. Exactly. And I fell in love with it because you've always mm-hmm. imagined what this could be. So. Yeah. Um, and it, it actually runs, runs true to when we had Roderick Dale on and he, he was telling us about this kind of idea of, of, the berserker actually being a dance rather than kind of like this typical mushroom eating warrior who ran in naked yeah. <laughs> like that's yeah. like the, the and, and thankfully like that's left behind in it and it becomes this kind of it's yeah it's like a ritual to whip you up into frenzy and and i know people tease me all the time in the discord for referencing me playing ruby on here <laughs> but like it's that it is that kind of thing and, and you understand i think when you play any kind of like physical sport where you it is like a brotherhood and you you whip each other up into a friend you know it's the pacific islanders have like the hackers where yeah. it's that pre it's like a pre-war war ritual 
where yeah. you kind of get into this area, into this mentality where you're going to go to battle. So it's yeah. not surprising that that thing would have existed. Oh, it would have existed. Or there would have been many forms of something like that because that's what people do. And, and that's what uh, warrior fraternities do. Uh, I mean, you have to imagine you put, and of course the entire, the entire Scandinavian world wasn't a world of violence. Most people were just farmers and fishermen and traders, but there were dedicated warriors who lived a life of violence. There were pirates and slavers who lived a life of violence. And these were people that had tremendous PTSD before PTSD was even a thing. Yeah. Um, and, and these were men who, who or, and women, uh, increasingly we're, we're seeing that women in some ways did play a part in different, in different aspects of the, the war world. Um, but these were people that uh, did perform ceremonies to get into a frenzy. Mm -hmm. uh, they also did these ceremonies to kind of, you, you kind of notice in the movie, I kind of like this. They're they're terrible. Like they're 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 killing. That scene is hard to watch. Where they're where they're you know taking uh, children and, and taking people and putting them in this barn and setting it on fire. And they're just horrible people. And they're and they have to do these ceremonies to kind of keep their own morale and to keep their own sense of uh, fictive kinship brotherhood. Mm -hmm. I, I thought there was a lot behind that scene. And also the chant, the words were super cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we were guilty of, of forgetting that these are these are humans, that mm. these are people, you know, we're we're a thousand years removed. But we need to remember that there are people with feelings of fears. And you know, it's it's this silly idea that we see in TV shows of like the the Till Valhalla, everyone wants to die. It's that it's that idea of the there's no fear in battle, and I don't think that's the case. You know, we're with the, the humans, and they 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 are scared of death, regardless of what I think what anyone thinks, because everybody is, whether it's a, a yeah. mercenary today yeah. or or back then, you you just fearful of that of that thing of, of of whatever happens. So, you know, you need those moments to whip you up to get you into the zone to get you there. Yeah. Um, and that's what I, that's what I like that it brings that humanity back almost. Yeah, yeah. and the, the chant was super cool too. Yeah, he does. He brings the human. It's great because there is a humanity in it, but there's so few likable people. Um, there's not really a fixed good or bad person in the whole film. Not really. No. Um, I mean, Amleth is not a good person, uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, and his enemy. Uh, Fjolnir is not a good person but he's also not as you learn later in the movie he's not the most terrible person either he, they all suck they're all just brutal bastards in a brutal bastard world mm -hmm. and that was pretty That's, cool yeah it is they're because... all human in in a dark world um mm -hmm. and doing what they're doing what they think is right or best <laughs> no yeah nobody's yeah nobody's perfect and 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 like apart from Anya's Anya's character, she's perfect. <laughs> Which one is that? The uh, the the and, uh, Anya Taylor, the the blonde lady. Yeah. Let me see. We're trying to find a flaw. No, yeah, she. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, ah, she was a pretty good one. So enough said about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So I want to talk about one of I don't know if he's I think maybe one of my personally controversial scenes um is when I'm gonna say a, a child before kind of whatever happens happens and they're in like the the churchy thing. It's not a church, but it kind of looks like a church. Um are you talking about the temple? The temple, yes. Oh, I know it's a temple. It's I know not it's a temple. church. <laughs> no, it's a temple, but it's kind of church esque in appearance. Which is one thing I wanted to ask you about is that the architecture of that, whether mm -hmm. because it looks quite does look quite churchy to me. So you're but, referring to uh, child omelet when yes. they go into the the temple, temple to do the ceremony with his dad. We, yeah, then I want to talk about the that bit. So okay. yeah, so like Alyssa said in the chat, like a stave, stave church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
it, it, it does look stiff, Churchy. But you want me to uh, talk about that first and then we go into... That, the yeah, part? that first and then let's go into yeah. the, the insanity of what ensues inside. <laughs> I love temple. what goes on inside that temple. All right, so we, we, we have obviously never found... Uh, we don't have Viking Age architecture. So we have to sort of... And this is why I hate the argument about the historical accuracy because we have to reel back and do a lot of research and argue about what is historically accurate. It looks stave churchy because uh, the stave churches, the stav churches are at least in, in, in their most basic, in the stav way that they are constructed based on older pre-Christian uh, uh, architecture. So we have found the most famous would be um, a place called Upakra in uh, Southern Sweden where we have found a, a stave building that is a cult house or a temple, uh, temple, hof, cult house. It's a holy building where ceremonies took place. Um, we found a number of those, and we do think that the stav churches are similar to those older buildings. Did they have dragon heads? We don't know, but I mean, their, their ships had, they had dragon heads and all kinds of crap. So they probably did, um, but we, we don't have any, we don't have any, so we can't verify. But to me, it is totally valid uh, and quite accurate to imagine a, an older pre-Christian holy building looking like a stav church, uh, more or less. So I thought that was, um, along the lines with what we know. Um, and then you add on to it, the art history and stuff like that. Okay, fair enough. I, I, I loved it. So you, you can feel free to love it. <laughs> there we go. All right, let's, let's get inside. Let's get inside because it's... <laughs> I loved inside. <laughs> Inside I mean, it was also my top three favorite scenes. <laughs> I mean, it it goes on in there. It gets it gets wild. It um, does. This is one of the points where I think the the movie maybe for me kind of maybe pushed it a little too far, mm. and I was a little bit kind of almost took me out to the point where I was like, "What the fuck's going on here?" It kind of removed me removed me back a little too far. Yeah. Um, which it's not really a negative because I, you know, I was there to enjoy it and mm -hmm. be absorbed into it. But sometimes, you know, you get those things that can kind of just take mm -hmm. you a little out of the, out of the zone. And yeah. That was, that's what I, I felt a little bit with that scene that it was just pushed it a, a little bit. What about it? Um, do you, what about it pushed you? Um, like, what about it felt I, too I, much? I think what I, what I didn't like, was the savagery of it in a sense of the it's all kind of this, this whole thing is, is kind of breaking the mold of like the vikings or people of you know, viking scandinavians being like these savages who, who knew no better and then you've got these two the, the king and his son on their knees sipping and howling like dogs mm -hmm. um and I, I I felt like it was kind of playing into that trope of of savagery, and and I kind of just was like, there's there's more to it than that. And I, and I think that maybe runs throughout the whole whole movie that I wish there'd been a little more. But like you say, movies about fucking farmers doesn't doesn't sell movies. You know, that's mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. never gonna sell a movie about people no. farming and, and being you know everyday life. Yeah. But I just think it. It kind of just leaned into that that stereotype of of them being these these kind of not stupid savages, but that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I'll give you my take. <laughs> I mean, I, I want I, it. That's what we're here for. Uh, yeah. I was extremely excited when I saw that scene. Um, <clears throat> um, and I, what I saw, well, first of all, the the idea of okay, so I I don't. It, it, this is my opinion. Um, I don't think he played into a stereotype of savagery. Uh, I think, unfortunately, 
a lot of people have the stereotype of savagery, um, but they don't understand the, the reality kind of behind it. I, I think uh, there is a lot of, if you were to, if I were to drop you in uh, a number of indigenous cultures, um, you would get culture shock uh, at what's going on. And some of it mm-hmm. would seem quite, uh, or I would also get culture shock uh, because some of what goes on in cultures outside of our own uh, can appear quite savage because they're not, because they're so different. Um, and I think if we could go back in time and enter the Viking age, we would find a lot of what happened to be very hard to stomach. Uh, we could talk about the boat burial, for example, that happens later on with the sacrifice of the slave girl. Um, but, 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 but I think that, so the, the acting like dogs and stuff, what I saw, and what I interpreted was, got me very excited. Um, because if you notice, uh, and I, I kind of, if you've seen my video, I talk about this, but I'll go into it again. Um, you have the temple, you got the center of the temple. That's the, that's the central sanctum of the holy place where the people go and the, the gods are held up there. And that's, at the, that's in the middle. Odin is being worshipped there. You, you've got uh, mm-hmm. different idols to different gods. I don't think they name them. But in the back, in, in the back of the room, there's a door and that door on it, uh, they never say it, but on the door is uh, a carving called, based on the Loki stone, uh, which uh, is a, you know, it's a, it's a stone depiction from the Viking age depicting who knows, but we have called the Loki stone. So I was like, ooh, 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 does this door lead to like a Loki place? Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, I mean, Loki is, I think he nailed the trickster, the transgressive trickster role in an animist society or an indigenous society. I think he nailed it in this depiction because they have to go in the back, away from the other gods, they go under the earth into the world of this transgressive god who breaks rules. And here's a priest, I don't know if anybody caught it, but the um, William DeVoe's character obviously is the priest, but he's mm-hmm. also the uh, the fool, the jester. Um, and the so when they're in the hall and the jester makes the really crude joke about, I forgot what, but uh, he grabs, like, like he makes a cock joke and Fjolnir threatens to kill him. And the king says, like, he is my friend. Yes, he's crude, but he is my friend. Mm-hmm. Well, that jester happens to also be sort of a priest of Loki. So yeah. here you have down in this pit, the king and the boy breaking all the rules. Kings are not supposed to behave this way. Boys are not supposed to behave this way. I mean, men. So I really liked it. They were running. It, it reminds me of like in Volsunga saga, Sigmund and Sinfriot, they, 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 yes. become, they become savages yeah, yeah, yeah. and wolves. And I think it was a lesson. Oh, also Jonas, this was something I didn't know, but Jonas filled me in on it. That scene underneath the cave, it's based on basically a henbane trip. And we know that they, we have found henbane uh, in uh, vulva graves. So we assume that henbane, which was a heavy intoxicant, played a role in religious ceremonies. And so here these guys are just tripping. Mm -hmm. And it's about, I think, uh, breaking the rules and establishing the boy finding his place and establishing himself as a human. How do you become a human? How do you become a man? And uh, yeah, so I liked it. I didn't think it broke any tropes. I think that they had, or I don't think it broke. I don't think it played with stereotypes too much. I think it went into the source material. And mm, I think this is why we need chats like this because there's this, there's things that the movie, even, even with me, you know, I've been doing this, what we're 111, 12, 13 episodes. I'm not sure what we're at, but you know, I've learned so much over it, but I'm still very much away from the point of like you, Mateus, and and the scholarly types that we come on here. Um, mm. So when I, Shan's just correct to me, 114. Um, so you know, I you know I like to think I've got a good understanding, but mm. things like that I miss. And, and then as soon as you said said there like the Volsunga saga, I'm like, fuck yeah, it does remind me of that. Now now you said it, 
Um, and I think that's that's why kind of like this is important, where we can import out, point out all those little things that he's done and tried to do. And really, whether whether you like the movie or not, you have to respect the the the, the fact that he's tried to go so far with all these little things to to keep justice to to what he wanted to create and and, and give justice to the the time period. I think so. And I, he really, he really, I mean, we know that he worked with uh, Neil Price quite a bit, uh, who is an expert on uh, on what we can say about the, the Viking Age sort of belief in spirits and relationship with the spirit world, the, the quote, quote, shamanism. Um, and he wrote a lot about it with his book, uh, The Viking Way, uh, which I highly recommend. But if you read The Viking Way, I think you will see a lot of the Northmen in it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and he also worked with my own advisor, Terry Gunnell. So you see, you can see their arguments or their, the things that they have said throughout the movie or throughout, yeah, throughout the film. And it, it's a lot of transformation. It's like the whole movie is about transformation. Um, and uh, there was another thing about that scene that I also didn't get originally but I, I brought it up to Jonas because obviously Jonas was in the film and I was like so this Loki thing I I know I'm right when I see this this must be what Robert Eagers is going for I mean this transgressive transformation trickster figure it, it's too perfect um he must have known he was doing it and Jonas was like yeah he also I forgot the name of the king I, but they call him the War Raven. So um, Omleth's father um, is an Odin figure. And the fool, who is the priest of Oki, also that mask he's wearing, it's based on a, a mask that they found in Iceland. Um, so, yeah, cool side point. But uh, throughout the whole movie, he's obsessed with the All Father, the All Father, All Father Odin, All Father Odin. And his father is basically, it's like this weird thing where this character is really just obsessed with his dad. His mm -hmm. father is an Odinic figure. He sees a raven and he says, father? And uh, you can never tell if it's actually Odin or his father helping him. So there's this very cool role between a Loki figure being the trick, the, the, trick, the, the fool slash priest, the Odinic figure being the Amla's father, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, and, and I think that that, I didn't even catch the Odin part when I watched it. So it's it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it's so fascinating that there's, that there's things that there's somebody at, at, a your, at your level, you know, who's who's dedicated a lot of time to to this and, and researching this, this world. And then that there's things in there that you don't pick up on Nah. So that that I mean that that has to show the level of of detail and want to kind of do justice and do right, yeah. um, and that that really speaks volumes. That you know people who really specialize in this are watching it and then going, you know, picking up on stuff, and then the next time around going, oh my god, I fucking missed this in the background and missed this and yeah. missed this. Yeah, and there's so many little nuggets like that. Like I even like to. I, there's just so many things I could go through the whole movie and be like, oh, this, 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 this. The, the Valkyrie has, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, her teeth are uh, filed. She has filed teeth. Filed teeth. We have. Yeah, I, I liked that. Yeah, no, I liked I, how the Valkyrie looked as well. Like, it wasn't uh, just some. I did some... not. Did you not? <laughs> this was I mean... one of my criticisms. I did like the filed teeth. Uh, I didn't like the Valkyrie scene. And I didn't like. Oh, the I, Oh, yeah, no. I don't think I necessarily liked the Valkyrie scene, but I, I I didn't mind how she looked in the sense that she wasn't like a big boob, like superficial pretty, you know, like that that typical yeah, Valkyrie fierce. that Valkyrie look. Yeah, she was mean. Yeah, and and I, I liked that. Um, yeah, I liked that bit. But let let let's talk about that. Let's talk about the Valkyrie scene and like this this Asgard gate. Yeah, I or. <laughs> In The Witch, back to The Witch, I thought that the movie would have ended much better 
if it had just ended with the girl walking into the forest and yeah, walking into the forest, maybe walking into the forest and finding a group of women dancing on the fire. But then she starts floating up and I was like, cheesy, gone too far, stupid. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. in this, had like okay, big spoiler alert. He dies. <laughs> when I'm... he dies. It shows him, maybe it's in his imagination, whatever, but there's this big scene of riding the bottle hull, and I hated it. He should have just died. You, it was over, it was redundant. You didn't need, it was like, it was also like Marvel. I hated the depiction of Valhalla. Yeah, I think that towards the end, I think the last 15 minutes, it got a little. <laughs> it was, it was I, I wasn't. I'll be honest, again, fuck, we, we might as well just kind of say that we're going to spoil the whole movie. So We've already we, spoiled it. We gave you all the warnings. Um, the, 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 the whole, like, volcano thing was a little much for me as well. Yeah, I felt um, like it was, um, it was like... It, was, it almost went into fantasy. I know, I know <laughs> it's fictional, but it went fantasy. And that was a little bit kind of... It just was like, like Frodo versus Gollum. Yeah. <laughs> it was like Frodo versus Gollum. Uh, what's the Lord of the Rings? Darth Vader become, before he becomes Darth Vader meets uh, um, um, Anakin versus Obi-Wan. It was, it, yeah. Yeah, I didn't like that scene. I, I, I didn't like the fight scene. It was... It, I'd rather watch Frodo and Gollum roll around <laughs> no, I like. I mean, I didn't like. I didn't mind the end of the fight scene. Um, all right, so we the 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 ascent into Valhalla hated it, and obviously the like. It looks very much like Heaven's Gates. Let's be yeah. honest. That's yeah. what it looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what 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 do you think about that? I hated it. Oh, <laughs> uh. I mean, there's a. I, 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 it looks so cheesy. I mean, for for one thing, okay. I also, I also, I'll just lay out the scenes I really hated. Um, I hated the scene where he escapes his bonds and suddenly there's fucking Odin standing there, like cheesy. It, was, it didn't even like the graphics look weird too. It looked like cartoon Odin, the most cliche odin you could imagine standing there i i was like Ugh, cringe the valkyrie scene i didn't like uh because it was for similar reasons and the ascent to valhall was so wagner meets marvel meets mm -hmm. yeah i didn't like them um because for one thing the movie does such a good job of not going over the top like the scene with the dragon where he's fighting inside the barrel mound such an awesome scene then you realize he's doing it kind of in his head mm -hmm. um another really fantastic scene is where the the he he where the men are all like flipping out where he's poisoned he's mushroom poisoned uh the guards feeling there's guards and they're killing themselves and losing their minds in the darkness and they think that there are evil, like like dark death spirits after them. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Easier, stay away. By the way, that's a much more realistic depiction of Valkyries, uh, death spirits that come and claim you. That is, I think, yeah. how the Viking world would have seen Valkyries, not these ladies on horses. But anyways, he does such a good job of riding the line of belief and what's real and what's a part of their worldview and then all of a sudden you got this glowing gates of Valhall it it was over the top and it also mm -hmm. I mean I don't want to go into not historically accurate but uh, probably not how anybody imagined flying off into heaven and <laughs> so yeah but, but what do you think of I guess because because the idea of like Valhalla now yeah. is very Christianized. This this kind of so do you think maybe that played a part that it did? There's certainly at some point there's a there's a Christian influence that gets into this idea of, of Valhalla 
Um, and it becomes almost a heavenly mm. type place. Um, and if that's what that's how it seems today. I think a lot of people who probably who probably um are quite critical of Christianity and the Christian influences in like on on paganism and on like this whole thing that but then they still probably celebrate this idea of Valhalla but don't realize that that's just no fucking like there's just like it's just heaven it's just what they they kind of used to assimilate the the whole yeah. transition into like yeah exactly I think that's a good word good way to put it that it's it's volatile is a part of the transition towards christianity uh and in many ways the odin the odin that we have i mean uh terry argued in an article that that odin is a uh he's a transitionary god i mean odin is a god that played a lot of roles over time i mean but by the end of the viking age odin is this this almost hybrid figure between what would have been sort of a, in, a sort of in, indigenous uh, animist perspective, and now you're you're increasingly getting this all-seeing God who can dole out reward, and He sees you everywhere. He's got his ravens watching you, and um, He does. He's not. He's not. He's not. The, he's not. Re, he's not Viking version of uh, of uh, of the Christian God, but he is getting there. But we also have to remember that the, the, the poems that we have that talk so much about Valhall, so much of them, as well as the prose that we have, do come well after the Christianization period. So it's very tough to talk about what did they actually believe? What If you could go back in time, right? When did the idea of, I mean, there have been books written arguing about, okay, how did the idea of Valhalla develop? It's it's spec it's very hard to say. Um, but I, I think that we should be a little bit careful about running too far away from Valhalla because um, the, 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 if you start, everything that we have is at least a little bit Christian influenced. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you can't, cut out the christian influences you, you really can't all you can do is kind of talk about the shift in worldview that begins to happen but by the end of the viking age pagan kings did believe in valhall mm -hmm. uh harold the Halfagri, if he was an actual person uh, but uh, seems to have been very much dedicated to this idea of valhall and um um <laughs> how can uh, no uh, yeah how come the good? How come the good? When he dies, uh, they they recite a poem for him, uh, and that's been passed down to us if if it's authentic. And he was a Christian, and even in his poem, how come how it's dedicated to him. It's basically a story about how well he was a good king, and therefore he had to go to Valhall, even though he was a Christian. And Odin is a bit angry at him because he's a Christian. And he doesn't really want to see Odin, but he's got to go to Valhall because good kings go to Valhall. Mm -hmm. and, and so he goes to Valhall. Um, they did believe in Valhall, um, but did they picture it up in the sky, glimmering, shining? I mean, I think that's more <laughs> Hollywood today. I don't even think Christianity thought of heaven in that way for a long Wait a time. Minute. I see. Mm -hmm. What was that? Who was that? Oh, who's, who's got that microphone on? <laughs> Ah, I don't know. I heard a ghost. I maybe. No, <laughs> oh, I don't know. It was Odin. Valhall is real. Oh. <laughs> there we go. It's all right. <laughs> Shan saw it. Ah. Um, did, you know, did, that's did the, that's the thing with having a live did, audience, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So you ask these questions, and they're uh, they are tip of the iceberg questions because man, each one of them could go. Oh, I I bet. I bet we could just probably do an episode on on each bit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've spoken about how much detail he's put into everything and yeah. really, really tried. So I struggle to think that he's just cut corners or just kind of with Valhalla just gone, fuck it. 
Like they, he must have based it on something. I, 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 I can't understand why he would just kind of put all this time into everything else, trying to, mm-hmm. trying to be as accurate as possible. And then when it comes to like Valhalla, just go, eh, let's just make it like heaven. So, so ching. Yeah, yeah, like he must have, there must be something. He can't have just gone so detailed with everything else and put so much time and, and thought. Yeah. And then just gone, nah. Whatever. Yeah, it's so, it's weird because these scenes are jarring, right? I mean, I think anybody that watches the movie, the Odin scene too, uh, you don't need Odin there to know that it's Odin. I mean, you got a flock of ravens setting him free. You don't need this cartoon figure of Odin just stand there. And then you got the shining Valhall. Um, I, do you think that's maybe for people who who don't know, who maybe aren't in... Because I, I, I find it insane. You know, when I people tell people like... If I have to ring up for car insurance, let's say, and <laughs> and and you know, I have to like explain, oh yeah, my company, what's your company called? Oh, it's Horns of Odin. People are like Horns of Odin, or, 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 like they they, I think like for the average person, we we just assume that everyone's right. gonna know who this right. is. But right. I, I, so maybe he's put that in, just to kind of like help people out a little I mean, bit. Yeah, maybe, but there's also. I, I kind of want to ask him. I kind of want to confront him. I mean, we've prayed because he's gotten. We've been trying to get him praise. on. We've been we we uh, we've been trying. He's gotten plenty of praise, so he can he deserves to also get a little bit of a roast. Um, I think he would take it well, though. I, I do think, think he would, he would too. Well. I, I, don't know, I don't know. I think he would, but I I wonder. I mean, and to bring up Jonas again, who I know is listening. Hello, Jonas. Um, Jonas suggested and we don't know but he he had the idea that perhaps this was a studio decision um and not actually robert eager's decision himself or perhaps because i mean this was these scenes particularly the you know the ball hall scene these were edited in i mean obviously they're i mean they're cgi they're 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 graphics so he couldn't have over i mean he maybe he oversaw them but they could have just been the studio making bad decisions i don't know i don't know um Maybe it would be worthwhile hearing what the average person who isn't such a nerd like us thought if they liked those scenes. Maybe, maybe. I, you know. Like I say, I think in in his defense, I think that there has to be some reason for it because he, I, th- I feel like he's so particular and so accurate with everything. I just can't think that it would just be be there without it. I, I don't. No, it's odd. It's odd. It's also, um, I mean, to point out also, I mean, from a storytelling point of view, that could also just be what's in his head. But uh, because, you know, he's dying. So, I mean, the first time it shows the Valkyrie, he's dreaming. But um, it, it does bother me a little bit because, because I, I don't, uh, that that idea of like horse riding Valkyries taking you up to, uh, I mean that that is a very late idea. Like I said, they were they were they were death spirits. Um, uh, oops, mm-hmm. sorry if uh, I just made a ding sound. My computer dinged. No, oh, stop mm-hmm. dinging. I'm gonna have to be cutting this out. <laughs> um, um. I think it was Rudolf Simek, a uh, researcher, went on a went on a tirade in uh, an article uh, where he was criticizing the idea of Valkyries uh, being horse riding maidens. Of course, they are depicted that way in the late sources, but he's like, these are demons of death, and uh, and I think it's worth remembering that the the old depiction of them they would have been. I think they would have been more like the spirits causing the men to kill themselves uh, mm-hmm. outside of Fjolnir's Hall. This, these just horrifying death spirits sent by the death god to pick you. It's, it's not glorious. It's terrifying. Mm-hmm. No. Um, yeah, I mean, the film is quite brutal as well. Yeah. It is, yeah. It is brutal. And there's, yeah. a, there's a pit... I'll be honest, there's not many things in in movies or TV shows or, or, or anything that kind of makes me scream. But there is one scene, 
Uh, I'm not gonna. I don't, I'm not gonna say. It. Oh, sure the, you know. We've already spoiled. What the? <laughs> we have. We have. All right. <laughs> All right. So this is. This, this, there's I know what you're where, gonna say. Where, where he take where he gets the sword to the face, um, like they, there, something about that made me feel uncomfortable. Yeah, and the slow prick into the already fucking destroyed <laughs> nose. Yeah, yeah, there was just something that made me think, and there's not many times that that happens to me. That's um, brutal, brutal about me. So, so yeah, I like the. The brutality of it but again i i kind of worried that it's playing into that kind of savage well kind of well, thing i mean again it's it's a legend and one of the things about the legends about the about the sagas themselves is they are over the top i actually mm-hmm. uh i actually uh wrote down Two two small parts of a, a saga that I enjoy. If you want, I can retell it uh, because yeah, it absolutely it sort of exemplifies how exaggerated the sagas are, and the sagas are full of these. So this is from uh, the saga of Burning Njal, Brenna Njal saga. Uh, it's basically Sopranos in Iceland. So it's it's like these houses just killing each other and setting each other's houses on fire. And in one of the scenes, uh, one of the guys named is Skarpaven is fighting another guy who's on the other side of a river named Thrawin. And it says, you know, um, he basically, come, Skarpaven comes charging across the, the ice towards Thrawin. And he, it says uh, that the, the ice slab was very smooth. And Scarpaven, ah, I lost my part. He basically runs across it on his horse, leaps over the river, and with his axe cleaves Thrawin's head through the jaw, and his molars fall out into the ice. He takes the molars and rides away. Mm-hmm. Later on, uh, Thrawin's family is getting basically revenge. His his clan has Scarpaven's family trapped in a hall that they're burning. So everybody here is burning to death. And, and that was real. People, that is, that was a part of warfare back then. But uh, Skarpe then is burning. He's inside the building. And one of the guys named Gunnar looks at him. He's climbing on the roof and he's like, hey, Skarpe then, you look like you're crying. As Skarpe then is inside of a burning building. And Skarpe then basically says, no, my eyes are just a little bit sore. Like, it's just the smoke. <laughs> and, uh, Gunnar kind of taunts him and says, I haven't been this happy since you killed my kinsman, uh, Thrawin. And Scarpe then goes, well, it basically says, well, if you love him so much, I have a memento for you. And he takes the molar and throws it at Gunnar so hard that it punches out Gunnar's eye and his eye dangles above his cheek and he falls off the roof. And it's, it's all just so exaggerated. Mm-hmm. This is the sagas. They yeah. are... They are guys telling stories that are larger than life, more violent than reality. And I mean, does it play into a stereotype? Sure. But I mean, stereotypes are based on a little bit of truth. And, and, and at least the sagas are very brutal. And uh, I want that. I want this. I, Robert Eager's version of the Omelet saga. I would rather watch that than Hamlet. Or a his, an accurate depiction of uh, Saxo Grammaticus's story. Because Saxo's version is quite boring. He's basically playing stupid for years um, instead of killing people. <laughs> okay, okay. I think there's I think there's one more scene we have to discuss. Yes, um, and I actually forgot about it until just now. I've been having too much fun and drinking too much whiskey. Yeah, um, <laughs> too busy so, ranting. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, it's the obviously it's like the, the 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 slave scene, the sacrifice scene. Yeah. Um, unless you have another scene that I'm, we're meant to discuss as well. I like. I mean, we can talk about all kinds of scenes, but uh, that's, that's. I, I the think scene. that's. I think that's the major one that we've kind of left out so yeah. far. Yes. Oh, you want me to take the lead on it, huh? <laughs> 
Do you do you want to? I mean, for me, yes, I, I see think... a character. I, I see a person commented, and they say that scene gave me Thirteenth Warrior vibes. Actually, <laughs> like how Hamlet and Shakespeare is based off of a an older account. Thirteenth Warrior is also taking at least that part and basing it off of an older account. And actually, uh, um, for one re- for one thing. All right, I I I love Thirteenth Warrior. I know it's really cheesy, but it's also really awesome. <laughs> cheese, cheesy is awesome sometimes. Thirteenth like Warrior people, cheese is great. People get hung up on stuff sometimes, and I uh, like cheesy yeah. stuff. I was so covered. Like, fuck it. What's yeah, what's wrong yeah. with like a bit of nostalgia and a bit of cheese sometimes? Yeah, and I feel like Thirteenth Warrior is from and the, the whole idea of Vikings and Norse religion and Norse mythology and all that shit. It's it's become so serious because people have sort of absorbed it into their identity in the last 20 years. And so now every, I mean, Vikings itself takes, it seems to take itself very serious, but, but 13th warrior, it feels like it's from an era when Viking stuff was fun, adventure and just, I love that movie. But anyways, the scene from 13th warrior is actually pretty good. Um, Mm -hmm. The, the burial scene is, it's actually a good scene. Um, in as far as movie depictions go it's fairly similar to the uh the actual account because this is based on an account mm-hmm. so robert eager's version is also based on an account the 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 thing that i think i want to point out a key difference between robert eager's version and the account the account is uh i think it was either the 11th century or the 10th century Ibn Fadlan, an Arabic traveler, uh, goes up the Volga into the Rus and uh, deals with what we think may have been Swedish or or Scandinavian people in the Rus. And he attends a uh, the burial of a chieftain. And this burial, this description, Ibn Fadlan's description is quite quite it's, it's very big detailed description. And much of it, we do think, was quite accurate um, because uh, there's a number of reasons why, but uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of reason to believe quite a bit of what Ibn Fadlan says. But his depiction is in on the Volga. So actually where the scene of the berserkers, you know, they're, they're going and raiding people and it would actually be roughly there. So he describes this burial of a chieftain and it's quite elaborate. Robert Eager's version is not attempting to be that burial, obviously, because he's talking about uh, a burial in Iceland. So he, he's not trying to replicate the exact same burial. He's doing a different one. Um, so it's a little bit smaller, but Robert Eager's version is, is actually quite vanilla compared to Ibn Fadlan, the original account. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you thought that part was hard to watch, Ibn Fadlan's uh, telling of what what happened on the Volga is a bit difficult to swallow. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a bit more, it's a bit harder. It's a bit more, much less vanilla. (laughs) So, but his his depiction is good, I think. How how accurate do you think Ibn Fadlan's version is do you think he? Do you think he's he's kind of playing into the 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 kind of like savage pagan thing no. and making it and making it worse? Or do you think that is what he saw and it's a fairly accurate account of? of the I events? think I think it's I think it's what he saw to the best of his ability to describe it, and most researchers think that it's what he saw. Mm-hmm. Um, um, nothing that he described is outlandish. I mean, we we have we have archaeology proving essentially every aspect of what he witnessed, from from young people being from human sacrifice to young people being buried with old people, um, to obviously the massive amounts of animal sacrifice. Uh, I, I mean there is no he, he didn't have a horse in the race he, he wasn't there to convert people um he, he he didn't he didn't there's no reason for him to really 
lie but okay. we're not really going based on his reason to lie it's 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 the way he describes things it's a we have found pretty good evidence to support um we haven't found that burial but we have found uh burials that are very it, it, everything he describes makes sense within what we know about uh pre-christian scandinavia but he's also very careful in his descriptions he, he doesn't for example they sacrifice a slave girl and and he doesn't he doesn't dis, he he says things like she drinks uh, she drinks from a goblet i do not know what it is and then he describes that she seems to be intoxicated. She's acting. So he's describing. He's not saying. And then they poured foul heathen sorcery down her throat in the name of their terrible gods. The way that so many uh, uh, so many Christian authors from that time described them. So it's not very elaborate or in an exaggerated way. There's not really a reason to doubt it. No, I think we just don't like what we're reading because it's tough to swallow but people do worse today and mm -hmm. people do worse in the christian world um the people and we gotta remember in a world like that people were much more desensitized to death so i don't think what he saw was very was was very outlandish given the time mm -hmm. so um, yeah no i think that i think that's fair um because <laughs> I think people forget this only recently that we've become so desensitized from death. Yeah. You know, you only have to go back to the Victorian times, particularly in England, you know, you would have, um, you know, butchery in the street. Yeah. And you would see, it wouldn't be uncommon. You'd, you know, you'd see, you see blood and gore and, and whatever, whether it, maybe it might not be human, but it's, you know, it's animal. It's there. You, you see it, you know where things come from. And it's only kind of now that we kind of get things in these nice little plastic packages so far removed from what they actually are. Yeah. Um, yeah. That we become kind of softened to that. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I, I, of course, I, I wouldn't condone the sacrificing of, of, of anybody to join their master. <laughs> I like the way you, you, how you feel the need to, uh, uh I don't him, think doing man. it, but I also <laughs> recognize it because it's, it's people in a, a very different time with a very different worldview because their, their relationship with death was so different. Their relationship with what happens when you die and, and stuff. So I, it was quite different. And, and like, I really liked in Robert Eager's version, I mean, what he does depict it does go along with the description. It, it makes sense. It all makes sense. Um, from the chopping the horse's head off to the stabbing of the slave to the, I really liked how uh, she was being lifted over what looks like a door panel because that's actually described. Um, okay. so they, keep, they keep lifting her up over, she like peers over a door panel and says, I see paradise and my master calls to me and stuff like that. And it, it was very well done, I think. Mm -hmm. So, no, yeah, I, th I, th I think it was. I, th I, th I think the whole movie is. And, like, see, you have to respect the depth and the, and the detail he's gone into. Um, whether you like the film or not, I think if, you, if you're interested in, in this, this stuff, this whole world, this, this, whatever you want to call it, community, I think you have to respect the fact that he's done his absolute best to try and honor it, but also tell his story at the end of the day. It is, it is a fiction, fictional story. He's telling his story, but he, he really has tried to honor everything. And, and, and yeah, you've got to, I, he can't, I can't complain at that. I really no, can't. I, no. And I think that the, I mean, because uh, I mean, I, it, it's a dark story. It's meant to be a dark story. It's not uh, well, Thankfully, it's not on the History Channel because then it would be worse. But uh, it's not it's not an attempt to depict historical accuracy. He, he's not trying to show the life of people in that period. He's trying to tell a story, a very dark story. But that story he wanted, uh, is very clearly it seems, he wanted that story to be rooted in the world that, that as we know it, that it came from. And I think he did that. Um, so back to the Gotham, <laughs> it's dark, but it's, it's still based on something. Um, and if he had, if it wasn't dark, it would have been, I don't know, it would have been a flop, I think. Yeah. Um, 
no, I, I, I like I say, I, I, I can't praise that side of it enough. I, I, I mean, I, yeah, I love the movie, but I think the, the fact that you say he, so many people could just, they could just tell a story and not care and tell, you know, make a, make a movie, make a good film. And you, you know, you don't have to care that much, but no. they, they very clearly is mm. this, this want to mm. do justice and do right mm. by the history. And that I, I find very commendable. Yeah. And I think that is what needs to be respected. And I wish more people did that and really kind of were willing to, because it, it can't be cheap either. It can't oh. be cheap to, 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 to do that, to hire the experts, to, to get the authentic kind of the, the material. We had Valhalla Silver on mm. um, a, a couple of weeks ago talking about how it was like £300 a metre for some of the, the fabric. You know, so, so there's, there's been money spent to make it as, mm. as close as possible. And you don't have to do that. And the fact that he wants to do that is, like I say, it's commendable. I think it. I, I enjoy it, and I and I like that, and I and I praise that. And yeah, yeah. I think I think a, a a good way to think about it is is because it, it's not. I have said uh, I'm not really into talking about whether or not it's historically accurate. I'm more into talking about whether or not it is authentic. If it's an authentic reception of what we have to create something, and, and a good way to explain that is. For example, uh, we'll take the soundtrack, for example. Viking Age music did not, was probably not, that this is cinematic, you know, music. The soundtrack is a lot of and very, like what we, all the throat singing, which has become so popular because it's cool sounding. Um, but if you will take, take a Viking reenact, a person who is a researcher of music and they're trying to make music as close as we think it may have been in the Viking Age. Um, and then you take, say, for example, Vardruna. Um, Vardruna does not sound like what Viking Age music sounded like. I think most people that hear what we think Viking Age music sounded like would find it rather boring. But the Vardruna is quite, because Einar knows what he's doing, uh, is quite an authentic reception and recreate uh, creating something new that it has roots in the source material mm -hmm. and I think that that if we had a historically accurate depiction of the Viking Age it would be boring mm -hmm. uh, we want something larger we want something mythological and we you know and that's what this is so it's an authentic reception, not a historical accuracy. Although there is a lot of accuracy in it. I mean, the costumes, uh, the, the a lot of it is it's super cool. Mm -hmm. I have a question right, for you. Me. Oh, go on, go on. Oh, I've got, what did you? What did you? I've got, what did you think? I've got, huh? I've got some. I've got, we've got some questions from people watching, but you you ah. ask me your question first. Ah, oh. what did you think of the ball game? Shall we, shall we uh, bring it, shall we revive? Actually, I think it is revive. Uh, what do you think of it? <laughs> Ball game. Um, I liked it. I like it because I think that, I think that that, that that would have existed. I think that I, I, this is me going from like, I have no idea. I have no idea if that's accurate or not. I, I do not know. <laughs> but I think there's something like that would have existed. I think that like ball, ball games and, and this idea of, of kind of like male masculinity pitting against each other, not in a in like a war setting, but it's still there. I think that would have existed. Um, so I liked it. I enjoyed it. What about you? I I I think that uh, well, I I, have, I think it should be uh, reintroduced. Um, Are we bringing it back? I think I well well that version isn't uh, we we don't the version of the maybe not maybe not quite like that. Ah uh, well, the 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 we don't know what what the game what the I forgot what it's called Knoplaker or something like that. But uh, the description of uh, ball games in the sagas, we don't have enough information to know if it was played like this. It probably wasn't. The version that we have looks like it's a combination of lacrosse and uh, rugby. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it was so cool that I think we should insert it at Viking festivals. And yes, we should. 
and and uh, not take responsibility for all the brutal injuries that. Uh, <laughs> that yeah, make sure they have insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big insurance. <laughs> oh, it would be good fun though, and it'd be better than fucking Gleamer. I mean, if we, yeah, 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 <laughs> um, it would be way better. Uh, and I think that. Um, I mean, you could have. They, I have. I looked it up, and I, I guess they do play a version of this at different Viking festivals um, without as much brutality. So it, it, it probably is quite fun. So um, uh, mm -hmm. I would play it. Just uh, maybe not with the free for all, smashing each other in the face with a uh, with oak, <laughs> yeah. Oak, uh, <laughs> it is a bit It is yeah. a bit yeah. All right, man. Let let we let. I mean, fuck, we've been going like an hour, what, an hour and a half now. Let's let's do some questions and then, yeah, let's get out of here. Um, so Alicia wants to know, she's, um, I apologize, Alyssa wants to know, uh, were there trees in Iceland at the time or <laughs> is it a myth that there weren't? There were, uh, but it, it wasn't, people seem to either think that it was either the barren wasteland it is today or it was like Norway, full of huge forests. And uh, we think it was mostly birch forests. Like what, there are parts of Iceland today that um, have these kind of shrubby birch forests. Uh, if you go to uh, Eilstadir, there's uh, up in the Northeast, uh, there's a forested area there. And most of Iceland or much of Iceland would have been forested like that, not big trees. Um, but there were there were parts with big trees, but there was also if you ever have ever been to Iceland, it has a bit of a diverse landscape. I mean, there's desert, and there was desert, mm -hmm. and there are vast empty spaces, and there were vast empty spaces, but there were also forests. Um, and there's forests today. We're try they're trying really hard to re to plant forests. They're just small and cute compared to everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> all right um so Jonas wants to know should we um hang on let me so should we talk about the historical accuracy or the mythical accuracy uh, which i think is a good point because there is a there is a difference to be had i uh um, I don't believe in myth, mythical accuracy because myths myths are always changing. Myths are are myths were always changing, and the myths that we have are just a couple versions that would have been countless versions of those. Which is why Robert Eager's version is perfectly fine. You don't need to have one canon version of a story. Mm -hmm. That's not how mythology or legend works. Um, that's why you can have 30 different versions of Batman. Particularly, all, I think particularly oral, oral yeah. traditions as well. Was it told, because, you know, we've said this time and time again on the podcast, I think that depending on where you are and what time you're in, these yeah. things change. People forget yeah. little details. Yeah. I mean, we've all played the, the game. I mean, oh, in well. the U yeah, telephone in the UK used to be called Chinese Whispers, which I, I don't think you can call it that anymore. <laughs> um, I'm sure that's, but when I was a kid, that's what it was called. Um, so tell you yeah, telephone. Um, yeah, we've all played that, and, it, and that's that. That happens, you know. If you've got ten people in the line, that fucking happens. So if you've got people a hundred years apart, of yeah. course that's going to happen. And in yeah. different geographical locations, it's yeah. going to be differently to suit kind of your surroundings as well. Yeah, yeah. And myth, myth is true if it contains social, tr if it contains truths for the people. I mean, a lot of these myths, uh, well, the ones that we have uh much of them they're related to rituals uh, they're not just sitting around a story and telling a fire they they have they they tell how to perform ritual and and they're a part of how you relate to the world around you they're not they're not some canon biblical tale so so it's very hard to talk about what is mythical truth and what is historical truth that's why i just like the word authenticity like is it an authentic reception I mean, we've got, because here's another good example that I'll use to try and describe what I'm thinking about. Like historical accuracy, I've said, is like an onion. 
Um, because researchers, you have to peel away the layers of what we think we know and what is theory, even among researchers. And what you end up with is uh, like you go to an archeological site and you just have spears laying there and you have post holes and you have elements of stuff. And the historical accuracy is the description of, oh yeah, we got 150 spears here and parts of a bone here. And, and then the archeologists and the researchers start getting creative. And they start saying, well, we think because of all this, and they start weaving together a scenario. That's what Neil Price does. That's what mm -hmm. researchers do. We're, we're making shit up. We're not just making it up, but it, it's, it's uh, it, it, our historical accuracy is our interpretations mm -hmm. of the past. We can't get at historical accuracy without becoming just a sterile laboratory. Perfect. Right. Let's let me see if there's I think there's one more. Let's scroll all the way back up. Only one. I think there's only one more. We've been going a while though, you know? Yeah. We've been, we've been going for a hot minute. Um I'm really good at ranting. I'm like the angrier version of Matthias. Yeah, you do well. There we go. Uh I was gonna say Alyssa asked again who let the dogs in, but I'm guessing that's relating back to the <laughs> I don't know why Shans put that. That's really back to the uh, the wolf scene of them sipping from the <laughs> in the in the temple. Um, I love that scene. I know, I know you do. I think maybe when I rewatch it, I might I might change my mind on it. So, um, so even if the scene was a bit corny, I like the shields were used as an offensive weapon. So that's not, it's not really a question. It's a statement. But again, that <laughs> I don't, Shan put these in here. Don't blame me for this. Um, so yeah, no, again, but that kind of goes back to, um, oh, I've forgotten the gentleman's name. Fuck, Rolf Waring. So we had Rolf oh. Waring on the, on, the, on the other week who told us about shields and how they were probably used offensively. Yeah. Um, told us the kenning for them being called murder wheels. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So I, I think that's interesting, and I, I, I do like that touch that that they used as probably more accurately than a defensive thing. Yeah, but I one of my other criticisms is of actually the fighting scenes. I, I thought. Okay. That, there we go. Let's hear this. Were, well, I mean, we'll take for example when the, the berserkers are, uh, or when Alexander, when his, when they're raiding the village. And he's just like strutting around, huh, killing a guy, strutting to the next guy. Huh. It was, come on, nobody fought that way. Um, <laughs> and it, it's, it was ridiculous to watch. Uh, I didn't like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then uh, um, and not, I, didn't, I didn't dislike it because it wasn't historically accurate. I didn't like it because it just looked dumb to watch this guy trudging around. Hack, trudge, trudge, hack. Um, yeah, the fighting, I'm not an expert on Viking Age fighting techniques, so I, I also don't really care overtly, but I have a feeling experts of fighting techniques were rolling their eyes a lot during that, during the fighting scenes. <laughs> but I, I'm, I wanted over-the-top fighting, like crazy fighting, Hollywood-esque fighting. Like like the Witcher, the Witcher. I have a lot of criticisms of the Witcher, but their fighting scenes are great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Let's 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 wrap this up. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. I think we've we spoiled the movie for sure. <laughs> um, but no, I've I've learned a lot, and you've definitely made me see things from a from a different side of things. Um, and I think. I find it so interesting that you didn't pick up on everything first time round, and that that, that kind ADHD. of. But, but I think, but I think that screams to to the level of detail that's gone into mm -hmm. it, because if it was just kind of minimal level, you'd probably pick up on ninety nine yeah. percent of things because it's just these one things. But because it's so much, I yeah. think that that that's a, that kind of surprises me. One more super cool thing. And I'll just sum it up really quick. When he meets that vulva, that when he meets the bearded guy in the cave, that scene is so awesome. Uh, you'll notice 
that guy in the cave, he's got the head of uh, the the William DeVoe's character. He's got William DeVoe's mm-hmm. head. He's yes. wearing a dress. He's wearing a dress, okay. and he gives birth to the head <laughs> in a save shamanic save ceremonies it, and then he goes into a trance but he gives like ritual birth to this severed head and then the spirit of the head goes into it and he talks with with the head with uh, the voice of the the corpse that scene was awesome and it was even though it was very dark uh it was really rooted in what we know of seder and what we know of shamanism and so it, it, it's, it's really dark, but it also makes sense. Mm-hmm. And that's what's so cool. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, there are layers to this, to this movie that that's why it was such a blast to watch. And you um, can watch it more than once. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's one that you can rewatch. And I like that. I wonder what Matthias thinks. Oh, we need to. <laughs> We're going to have to ask him. He's going to try and be different and go, who sucked? It was so historically inaccurate. What Josh <laughs> said was it was actually wrong. This part was actually he's gonna really nitpick it. Just maybe, <laughs> maybe, but you know he's he's always gonna be him. I can't wait to get him back. I actually felt bad recording without him because this is the first time like we've done one without him. Um, so yeah, you 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 can take credit for that. One hundred and fourteen episodes in, we've done them all together. Um, and I had to message him. I'm like, man, I, I feel like I feel bad. I feel all like, it feels weird, but um, like you know, thing things happen. Like and you're having be... a dirty, filthy affair with him, with me <laughs> on him. You, you're my day, <laughs> yeah, my day weekend away. Yeah, uh... <laughs> but you know, he'll he'll be back next week. You know, unfortunately, these things these things happen, but we have to keep trying. You know, be consistent and, and get things out every week. Um, just to re- reiterate what I said at the start, you know, I we appreciate everybody that listens every week, who subscribes on on YouTube, who follows us on on Instagram, on Facebook, and again, everybody who, who follows us on Patreon that that means the world to us because it helps us keep growing the show and and put more money in and, and kind of help just help make it better and, and yeah. invest back in. You know, we don't ever take any money out of it personally everything gets invested back into into this and, and trying to make something um bigger so we we do appreciate you know the, the people come along and we've we've, we've maybe been a little off lately because we just haven't been able to find that rhythm things have been going on um but we're going to get it back and we're going to kind of get back to that that nice routine that we had so just thank you for for sticking with us i think is the is the sentiment behind that yeah, I, I mean, I, I really love what you guys do. So, uh, because, uh, and many people have already said this, there's, it's so hard to find good material and good things that people can listen to that are interested in this sort of stuff. And, and you guys have the, it's just a, it's, it's a great podcast. It's a great way of getting people who don't know to the material to learn more, but it's also accessible and fun, entertaining. Um, so I, I love it when I get to be on here. So uh, you're welcome I back anytime to it. So anytime when you when your when your next project um, comes out, you'll you'll be back. I think people will love this. You know, it's been a it's been fun. I've enjoyed the I've enjoyed the conversation. You've been a you've been a worthy co-host. Good, good. <laughs> All right, let people know where they can find you. Follow follow you. Follow your music. Everything. Whatever, yeah, whatever you, you can, want to shout out. I mean, you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook. I'm sure they're gonna link my my instagram and my facebook uh you can also follow my band nexion but it's black metal it's not really nordic and of course check out nabala which is Jonas's project but i'm contributing to it and a part of it mm-hmm. uh and uh yeah follow me on instagram to keep up with the the ensuing announcements there we go so. yeah go go follow josh and again to get again to shout out Jonas. you know he he helps us out week in, week out. Um, comes on, does the story time, you know. So so yeah, go and go and follow whatever Jonas does and his and Nabal and you know the music, everything. Um, yeah, I, I've got a lot of time for 
for Jonas and, and you know the time he helps us helps us create this. So yeah, um, thank you to you, Josh. Thank mm-hmm. you to everybody who follow us. If you if you enjoy the show, please uh, take a minute to leave us a five star rating and a positive review on wherever you listen to this. It, you you may think it means nothing, but it helps us kind of bump up the charts and also it makes me smile when we get a positive one. I read them and, you know, it makes me happy. Um, subscribe to the YouTube. If you can, please consider popping over onto Patreon, Nordic Mythology Podcast. Um, and you get a bonus episode every week. So, like I say, it's either a Q&A with Mateus or question, a story time with, with Jonas. I think it works out as maybe 12, 15 pence a day or something like that. So it's really worth it. You get the whole back catalog and it helps us helps us grow. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for everyone for again for sticking with us and we'll see you next time.